God never forgets the tasks he gives you. Sunday, Adelaja. God is at work even in those times where we don't see it or can't feel it. Everything ultimately comes down to trust. Ryan Stevenson. We are not cisterns made for hoarding. We are channels made for sharing. Billy Graham. Our business, whatever comes, is to continue to believe and follow Jesus, certain that a divine blessing is coming our way. In the middle of the worst storm imaginable, we tie ourselves heart and soul to the mast of the truth of God's promise that disappointment will lead to hope. It's not that we won't hear the screeches of the enemy's lies in the night, but we will refuse to chart our course by them. Sheila Walsh. Fear is the glue that keeps you stuck. Faith is the solvent that sets you free. Shannon L. Alder. It may come to a point where you would think all hope is gone. That moment is the time to trust God to take control. Ojingiri Hannah. If our surrender can move the hand of God, imagine what our cooperation can do. Andrina Sawyer. I am the way, Jesus. Well, good morning and welcome to everyone here in Oakville and online watching us. Uh, this was supposed to be week one of a brand new series of charting a pathway forward and letting uh, our community know, hey, this is where we're headed and this is, this is what's happening. But what we realize is we've been through a, a pretty significant month as a church community, uh, starting with this idea of resolution and going through a, a concept and idea that's new to many of us called solemn assembly or sacred assembly. And uh, that journey culminated with a, uh, a time here in Oakville that was uh, five, days of the, uh, five days in the week of just uh, intentionally consecrating time to just seek God and to hear and to learn from Him. And then yesterday, if you were here, we had an opportunity to tell our story as a church. And as all of these things were starting to come together, it was discerned that, like, no, this is, this is actually a significant moment in our, our uh, time of our church, so it would probably be good to just pause for a moment and, and process a bit of what we've experienced over the past, what we've gone through over the month of January, and just sit in that for a moment and talk and reflect. So we've got my dear brother, uh, Matt Miles here, our uh, interim senior director, and uh, he's going to share a little bit about just um, what's been on his heart and his, his processing for the past month. And um, for those that don't know Matt, Matt has been a part of our Meeting House community in East Toronto. It's, it's always All been East Toronto. Toronto. No, we started in Uptown Toronto 19 okay. years ago. 19 years. So you're, like, you're an OG. Been OG. around for a bit. Yeah. Matt, Matt's been uh, such a, an important voice in our uh, leadership team and uh, a contributor in the ways that we're moving forward as a, as a community, which I appreciate a great deal. And um, what else can we say about you? Long walks on the beach and uh, enjoy the convertible with the wind blowing through... Uh, through the long hair? Yeah. Yeah? Exactly. I love that. Channeling my aspirations. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, we're uh, encouraged and looking forward to what you have to share with us today. So Thanks, Quincy. God bless you. Appreciate you a lot. Yeah. Good to be here this morning. It's good to be here in person. And also, like Quincy said, I know what it's like from 19 years of being on the other side of the camera to not be here in person and wonder, hey, do they see me? Do they see us in all those other locations? So we see you. We see you. We see you everywhere you are, online and at home and in our other locations. It's beautiful to be a church family that's spread out, but united with a common mission and a common cause and a common purpose together. Maybe we can have a little bit of a if to bum moment. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah. It's fun to be us moment. Yeah. It's fun to be us moment. Can we have a little bit of an if to bum? That's something we've said over the years across the meeting house. We can have it's fun to be us moments. I would love if those of us who are gathered here today can rally and give a shout out to everybody who's watching somewhere else. Not yet. Wait to the count of three. Come on. Okay. Can we do that together? Yeah? Can we do that to see each other? Jesus was so good at seeing other people, wasn't he? The practice of seeing others is just a really great way to orient ourselves to being more like Jesus. So on the count of three, 
Let's do it for everybody who's not here. Let's send them some huge love, okay? One, two, three. Yes, yes. I'm going to be honest, that exceeded my expectations. That was pretty impressive. Now, we're not done. Everybody who's out there and not in this building physically, I want you to do the same thing. And I've been on the other side of this. I know that it's kind of weird right now. You're like, yeah, but we're not live there. Is he really talking to us? Are we really doing this? Like, yes, you're doing it. There's an invitation, okay? So if you're out there, we're all in this together. On the count of three, I want you to just send some love down the 401, down the 400, down the 404. You see what I did there? I didn't risk naming all the other locations and forgetting any. But I did name the highways that I think to get, about everywhere, that get to about everywhere else that we have locations. So on the count of three, shout it out if you're not in this building and send some love in this direction. One, two, three. Yes, it's anticlimactic, but trust me, it's really, really, really good. And half an hour from now, when the live stream delay kicks in, there's just going to be this wave of volume that's going to just wash over this facility, trust me, it's coming, it's coming. It's a fun to be us moment. So like Quincy said, we've been on quite a journey, haven't we, as a church? Even just in the last 24 hours, we've continued the process of unpacking our story, and that'll continue in the weeks to come. We're going to be releasing some things that we can all engage with online, some material that helps us all learn and engage in our story together. The last week, it's been different across all of our different locations, but in some way, shape, or form, many of us have experienced the culmination of solemn assembly together, and God's been on the move through that time. And in the last month, we've been journeying through that process together through our teaching and through experiences in our different locations. And even in the past year, we've been through so much together. In the past two or three years, we've experienced a pandemic. In the last 38 years or so, We've experienced a journey as a church. And hey, let's just keep going, even before that. This thing called church following Jesus is quite an extreme adventure dating back to all the way to the beginning, isn't it? And Jesus kind of told us it was going to be like that. It shouldn't be a surprise. And he's not unfamiliar to the extreme adventure. I don't know if any of you have watched any of these interesting documentaries about extreme adventures, or maybe you don't need a documentary because this is actually like your personal lifestyle, and I think that's awesome. But I've seen a few, whether it's going on a journey to summit 14 mountains in two months, or journeying across the wilderness through these crazy conditions. You know what's fascinating in these extreme adventures is this concept of base camp. When these teams have gone through a leg of a journey, and there's still more to that journey ahead, but they set up base camp, right? In between legs of the journey. And base camp isn't just like, time out, we're doing nothing. Base camp is important work. There's rest happening at base camp. Absolutely there is. But there's taking inventory of supplies, healing some wounds, There's celebrating where we've been and what we've come through. There's anticipating what's coming next. There's crying a little bit. There's laughing a little bit. And what's really interesting, as I've watched these documentaries and seen people that go through these extreme adventures, is there's a lot more than just functional purpose to this idea of base camp. It actually also becomes a moment of reorienting around the whole why of the journey and the purpose, and the destination. And you always see these people that are part of the team whose gifts come out in that moment. Like, wow, that's the encourager on the team. Because in an extreme journey, what happens? You get through that last leg. You're tired. You're weary. And it's not just physical either. Hope starts to fade. We've been through adversity. Are we going to make it? We're drifting. Hey, we're losing Bobby over there. We got to pull him back in. We can't do it without him. And it becomes this deeply emotional, dare I say even spiritual moment of rallying around, why are we here? We're too far to turn back, but we're not there to the destination yet. Just fueling our packs isn't enough. We need to reorient around our purpose for why we started this journey in the first place.
And as people on this crazy extreme adventure of following Jesus, it feels really important to me, personally, but for our church, that we don't miss the opportunity before we set out on whatever the next leg of our journey is to be really clear on what's our why? What's our purpose? What's our destination? That's going to be the fuel that keeps us going more than any elaborate plan or packing our backpack with the things that we need. Those things will come and those things are important. But this is an invitation for us as a church to really recenter around the reason why we're here in the first place. That's a good base camp practice in between legs of the journey. So, beautiful thing is, we're not left to figure that out on our own. We have this beautiful guidebook here. It's not about the guidebook, but the guidebook is beautiful, and it points us to the purpose of our journey. Spoiler alert, the purpose for us as a person and is Jesus. But let's talk about that for a little bit. We're going to dive into scripture this morning. We're going to spend some time in Philippians 3 together. Now, if you're wondering where Philippians 3 is, it's in the New Testament. Pretty close to the back. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Acts, and Romans, follow on. Corinthians 1, Corinthians 2, remember these eight, it's easy to do. Fa la 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 la. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. 1 and 2, Thessalonians. Timothy 1, Timothy 2, Titus, Philemon, and Hebrews. James and Peter 1 and 2, three books from John and one from Jude. (laughs) Then comes Revelation. Okay, that was not planned. (laughs) And all I can say is that you know you love your church family when you're willing to be embarrassed on the spot like that. I may regret that, who knows, but it just happened. I can tell you a great story about that song, honestly, if you want to talk to me after. Let's get to Philippians 3. So the context here, Paul is writing this letter to this church at Philippi that he planted 10 years ago or so before this letter was written, encouraging them giving them some instruction. Has all the reason in the world to be bitter in this letter for what he's experienced, but he's not. It's a very hopeful, very joyful letter. Remember, Paul is this fascinating character. He's now known as the Apostle Paul, but before that, we know he was the lead persecutor of the church. Came from the religious establishment, had all the pedigree, was dead set on tearing down this new movement of Jesus followers. And then, of course, saw Jesus on the road to Damascus after his resurrection and was converted into a passionate, fiery follower and apostle of Jesus. And so we pick up the plot here in Philippians 3. In the middle of verse 3, Paul says, We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. So Paul's setting up for us here, not a list of bragging points. It might sound like that. Remember, this is someone who's about to go on to tell us that this is all worthless. What he's doing is he's he's acknowledging that before I aligned myself to the purpose and power of Jesus, this was actually what mattered to me. He's not bragging. He's right. He was the man. Because without Jesus, this is what things are reduced to. If we go through what he's saying there at the beginning of those chapters, he's really recounting what? He's recounting his identity and his status. I was a real Hebrew if there ever was one. He's recounting his knowledge, his study, his grasp, his understanding of the right way. And he's recounting his performance. I obeyed the law without fault. His status and identity, his knowledge and his performance were the sources of his value up to this point. This can be true for us as individuals. 
Can I propose to us that it can also be true for us as a church? As long as we have the right affiliation, the right denomination, the right brand, the right reputation, as long as we have the right theological doctrine and knowledge and right answers, and then as long as we perform well enough, as long as we're growing in attendance, as long as we're financially sustainable, as long as we're hitting all those markers of success, we've got our value. Does that resonate? It's a cautionary tale to any Jesus follower and any church, including us. But it doesn't end there. We pick up in verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Classic Jewish hyperbole here, but the point is true. Relative to everything else, Jesus is infinitely important. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my, my Lord. Now we know that when we hear knowing in the New Testament, it's more than just knowing. It's knowing, experiencing, being in intimate relationship with. And that's what Paul means here. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. We're getting to the goal of our whole purpose and reason for being and destiny is what? To know and become one with Jesus. To know and become like Christ and to help others do the same. We're reorienting our GPS to this as our destination. And Paul goes on to say, in verse 12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I haven't achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Paul's not talking about forgetting history chronologically. We know that because the biblical narrative, including the New Testament, is so focused on recounting the story to learn of God's faithfulness and project it forward in hope for the future. What he's saying is, I forget my old self. I leave that behind. That idea I had of what gave me my value and my worth, that's done. And I press on towards the new prize, my identity in Jesus, the process of transformation towards becoming more like him. So before we go any further... It's worth us pausing, not just today, every day really, but being reminded as we spend time at base camp. Are we ready to rally around this purpose? Because it actually means changing some things about what we measure and what we value and how we identify ourselves. And I think this is a rally call for us as a church that couldn't be more timely. You know, in my own personal life, even over the last year, I've been so encouraged that God wastes nothing. James 1 reminds us that through our troubles, through our tribulations, these are actually huge opportunities to do what? To become more like Jesus and know him better. And I have felt Jesus saying to me, Matt, I want to shape you through trials and tribulations. I want to shape you to be more compassionate and see the need and the pain of others around you that maybe you have blind spots for seeing. I want to shape you into someone who's quicker to listen especially to people who maybe see things and experience things differently than you do. And I want you to become more of a peacemaker, like I was the perfect peacemaker and modeled for you. And that gives me hope because it makes me realize that, hey, whatever's coming, there's deep purpose if it gives us an opportunity to become more like Jesus. So with that purpose in hand, there's a couple of practices I'd love to just briefly invite us to engage in together, kind of like base camp essentials. Remember, base camp isn't a timeout. There's work to do here. And one of those is celebration. 
You know, we think of celebration as pom-poms and woo, the things that make us feel good, and that's good, that's fun. There's nothing wrong with that. But can I propose to us that as Jesus followers, the idea of celebration actually takes on a different meaning. If we look throughout Scripture, what we see is we see people celebrating what? Who God is and what his track record of faithfulness is. Celebration for us is like reestablishing our GPS to the destination of Jesus by remembering his faithfulness, his track record of unfailing love and mercy in our lives. And that was part of what we did yesterday. And it wasn't just a one and done event. We celebrated how God's been at work in the life of our church. And as we do that, we remember that, hey, we're setting our destination to a God that looks like Jesus. And we're establishing continuity of the ways that he's been part of our journey already and will continue to be if we're faithful. And some of those things we recounted, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it's important to put words to some of these things, that we're celebrating not to center ourselves, but to decenter ourselves and realize this is God's story that we're a part of, and he's active, and he's faithful, and he's good. We celebrate people coming to faith or having their faith restored as part of this church. People finding loving community here. That's been true in my life and in my family's life, and I celebrate who God is in providing that. We celebrate his provision through the generosity of resources and spirit of this community. We celebrate what he's done in the lives of our kids and our youth. We celebrate the impact locally and beyond our borders through our compassion ministries. We celebrate the way we've discipled one another in home churches and in so many other groups and ways. Ministries like healing care, community events, the list goes on. We celebrate who God is and how he's been faithful to us as a community. Another base camp essential is the idea of lamenting and repenting. And it's no surprise that this one's a bit harder, isn't it? But when we remember that our purpose is to know and become like Jesus, that means that change and transformation is part of our life. Our purpose is a process. Our purpose is a process, transforming to become more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. Says this. <laughs> so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed or transformed into his glorious image. So the context here is St. Paul writing a letter to a different group of people, reminding them that, hey, under the old covenant, we had a veil. We weren't really able to see God clearly, but Jesus has lifted it, and we can see him perfectly now through Jesus. And when we see him, now we have the opportunity to become more and more like him. And how? Through the power of his spirit. This is the process of transformation and spiritual formation in us into the likeness of Christ as Jesus followers that's core to our purpose. And this isn't just abstract theology. When we lose sight of this, we're at risk of a lot of things. And one of those is misunderstanding and stigmatizing what repentance really means. Because if celebrating is the act of reestablishing our GPS on a God who is faithful, then repenting is simply acknowledging that we drift off track, off the guided path, and we need to... Reset our GPS to the destination of becoming like Jesus. We all come from different places and are all on a different journey and we're all missing the mark. But we all can repent and reset our GPS to Jesus. When we look at it that way, it doesn't dilute it or take away the weight or the importance, but it puts it in its proper context. It's an opportunity to reestablish our path towards Jesus. And in doing so, Receive what? His forgiveness, his mercy, his unfailing love. To look at one another and say, hey, you missed the mark too? Whew, I see myself in you. How about we both turn back to Jesus together? Oh, that's a different view of repentance than what we often talk about. And it's important individually and corporately, isn't it, too? 
I know this is hard. It's so much easier to talk about individual repentance because, hey, I got to own my stuff, right? Absolutely that's true. I know there's a lot of us struggling with, what's this corporate repentance deal all about? Hey, what's my role in stuff that happens in a community like this if it wasn't me? I'm not being flippant right now. I get it, and I feel that personally, and I understand. But let's press into that a bit together. This is important. If that's our mindset, we're not a community. We're a collection of individuals who have retreated into our own corners and are just looking at our own track records. And I think, and I hope, we are a community. But we're going to need different questions to encounter the true meaning of repentance if we believe any of this. Rather than asking, well, who's guilty? And who's going to take the hit? We're just going to need to like, rewind and set a new paradigm for ourselves. We're going to need to ask questions like, are there people hurt and broken around us? Do we see them, and are we willing to address that? That's a different question, right? It's an honest one, but it's a different one. And are we willing to corporately take ownership for resetting our communal GPS to God as the destination? Those are different questions than who done it? Where do we point the finger? Those are questions that bring me encouragement and hope. And they're important for us. And that's why doing this corporately is just as important as doing it individually. Now, yesterday, we had the opportunity. For those of you who were here, you know. For those of you who weren't, we're hoping to make that recording available for our wider church family. To walk through some prayers of celebration, of lament and repentance, and looking forward. And there's a few reasons why we're not going to do that in full today. One of them is because we're not in the business of spiritual manipulation or coercing people who showed up on a Sunday to engage in a written prayer when you haven't had time to sign up voluntarily to do that or to process that. But there is an invitation to go further. We're going to post those prayers online, and we'd encourage you to read them, to sit with them, to, together with your community and your home church, with others who you're walking with. This isn't just a one-and-done moment. We did that on Saturday, so we move forward. No, we need to sit in this space together, celebrate God, receive his healing power, learn from where we've been, and carry that forward with us. All I want to do this morning is just recount a few of the themes that we are processing as a church, because it is important that we talk about these things. We're processing and repenting of pride. Of carrying on in our own strength at times. Of any time that we've considered ourselves superior or better than. As individuals and as a church. Or where we haven't listened to others outside of our walls or even within. We're processing ways we've measured things that mark success the way the worldly kingdom does instead of measuring how much we are knowing and becoming more like Christ and helping others to do the same. We're processing and repenting patterns of particular kinds of missing the mark, like sexual sin and misconduct and abuse that are part of, part of our past and the hurt that those things have caused. And we're processing and repenting of unhealthy satisfaction, of healthy desires, of ways we've idolized celebrity and created it, of times we've acted like a corporation and not a church, of ways that we've used people and one another, not cared for people enough to hold them accountable or ways we've done whatever it takes to keep the production rolling. Ways that we've 
valued polish and quantitative growth more than authenticity and humility in the character of Jesus. That's not the totality of our story, but it's part of it. And if we're committed to those questions I mentioned before, it's not a whodunit game. It's a question of, are we willing to see the hurt, address it, and reestablish our GPS? We can all take ownership for those questions. And if you're still struggling with the idea of corporate repentance, don't feel dismissed or judged or like anyone's angry at you, but don't just sit there. Really, talk to someone. Talk to someone in your community. Talk to someone else who's struggling with it or who maybe has heard from Jesus and is processing that in a healthy way. Talk to your pastor. This is a growth opportunity for us as a church. Let's not miss it. Don't feel judged. Don't feel ashamed. We're learning this stuff together. The beautiful thing is it doesn't end there. Our God is a God of hope and expectancy. This is an invitation to the next leg of our journey that God is giving us. And there are some things that we think he's been saying to us and drawing our attention to. These aren't the revelation of the elaborate five-point plan that's going to characterize our next five years. These are core principles we think he's been saying to us as we've listened over the last week, month, months. We think he's talking to us about, hey, you're going to need a centered set, Jesus-centered paradigm to make it through whatever lies ahead. You're going to need to understand how to use power within your community the way I do. As Jesus. You're going to need to understand reconciliation and what that ministry really represents that I gave you between one another when there's brokenness and between me and you as God. And you're going to need to really listen to and understand what it means to embrace the power of the Holy Spirit in your community rather than trying to do it on your own strength. And those are some themes that we feel like he's revealing to us that we're going to spend time in the next few weeks sitting with at base camp. So we invite you to be part of that. Let's do this together. Let's listen to what he's saying to us as a church through some of these important themes. And the beautiful thing is, these don't not sound like us, right? It's this idea of the now and the not yet of the kingdom and of us being made in God's image but being broken. This sounds like who we are and want to be at our core. These are not radical, dismissive departures from who we've been, but they're challenging shifts to keep emerging with more and more focus towards who Jesus is calling us to be, letting go of some things and picking up some new things along the journey. I really got the large water here. Love it. So if you've been around with us for any length of time, we used to do what's called Purge Sunday at the Meeting House. Anybody remember Purge Sunday? A couple hands going up, maybe online, and in our locations, hands are going up too. And you know what? Maybe there was some beauty in Purge Sunday. Maybe there was some good motivation. Purge Sunday was when we challenged one another as a community to say, hey, if you're here, we want you to get involved in the, the work and the mission and the ministry of our church and get involved in discipleship personally. And if that doesn't sound like something you want to commit to or explore or take step towards, we, maybe we can help you find another church. Maybe there was some good in that. But maybe there was also some pride in that. Maybe we can learn from that. What if we reimagined Purge Sunday and thought of it more as Invitation Sunday? And what if it was every Sunday? Where rather than talking about what we wanted to purge, we issued a radical invitation to one another and to those on the margins that are looking in to be part of this community. And what if this invitation sounded something like this? As you can tell, I don't often read from notes when I talk, for better or worse. <laughs> but sometimes there's a beauty in the intentionality of writing things down 
something crystallizes, doesn't it, when we do that? It activates more of a commitment. So I wrote down some cues that I feel very deeply and personally, and I wonder if we would as a church, around the kind of church we want to invite one another to be and to become and to be part of. If you want to be part of a church that doesn't have it all together and is messy and is broken, has had the pride kicked out of it, but is desperate to know Jesus like never before, and is humbly putting one foot in front of the other every day on that journey, locking arms with each other, that believes God is in the business of restoring and redeeming broken things, you're invited. If you want to be part of a church where the people are vulnerable and open about our failures and our flaws, not out of despair, but because we know we can put them at the feet of the unfailing love of Jesus, you're invited. If you want to be part of a church that's committed to listening to God through community, even when that takes time, and relying on the Holy Spirit to point us to Jesus, not our own strength, you're invited. If you want to be a part of a church that values good teaching and good shepherding, but that identifies and activates the fullness of the diversity of the gifts of the body of Christ in our midst, where no one person is elevated above anybody else, but we're in this as peers together, you're invited. We see you and you're invited. If you want to be part of a church that's working imperfectly to make it a safe place for everyone to bring their whole selves, you're invited. If you want to be part of a church that's first and foremost a network of local churches embedded in our communities and not just a broadcast platform, you're invited. If you want to be part of a church that's set on being more of a caring hospital for the broken than a museum for the righteous or a business or a corporation, where we're in the business of allowing Jesus to heal and bring new life, you're invited. And if you want to be part of a church that values forming people into the character of Jesus more than counting YouTube views and podcast downloads, well, we'll take those too. You're invited. I'm not just some paid hired gun. I'm privileged to serve in this interim season, but this is my church family, and I want to be part of that church. I don't care what walls or building it is. When I say part of that church, I mean you, literally, the people that I love, and you, out there, in East Toronto, my people. (laughs) I want to be part of a church with you that looks like that. And here's the beauty. If we're all willing to respond to that invitation and show up to be and become and be part of that church, and we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus the whole time, There's hope. Whatever resources we have, wherever we are physically, we can be that church by responding to the invitation. That is up to us. Let's pray. Jesus, we just love you. We thank you for modeling for us what perfect love looks like. We celebrate who you are We recount your love and your faithfulness even through our missteps. We lament and repent not to hang our heads in despair, but to honestly learn from our past and to reestablish and reset our GPS to you for the next leg of our journey. And we look forward with patience at the possibilities of what it could be to to become and to be a church that has our eyes solely fixed on you as our one true leader and our one true hero. Will you help us be that church, Jesus?
Amen.